Actually, this is when Zoom says that recording is the progress. This is the official start. Announcers are not, not needed anymore. Okay, thanks for coming to the second lecture. That means I didn't completely screw up the first one. Okay, so I want to remind you where we ended last time. Uh, the sort of the punchline was this uh, Adam's dichotomy for or Adam's characterization of amenable trees. Like you look at the tree, you want to know which one which ones are amenable. You look at the tree and you want to know whether it's amenable or not. And the characterization is was in the PMP setting, uh, so measure preserving setting. Uh, it says that uh, you, a measure preserving tree, uh, PMP tree is amenable if and only if it simply has at most two ends in each component. Uh, so, uh, and then I mentioned that this fails outside of PMP. So even if you were in the measure class preserving setting, and I want to um, begin by an example uh, that I mentioned the example a canonical example is the boundary action of, say, the free group on generators uh, uh, that I want to describe because it is instructive and it tells you maybe what should be the right generalization of this Adams dichotomy. Okay. All right. So let's uh, now move on to this example. There's a counter example to uh, uh, Adams dichotomy in the measure, pre measure class preserving setting. All right, so uh, let uh, F2 be the free group on two generators. Give the free group. Maybe. Uh, so boundaries are defined in general, but I'm going to just define it for this particular group. So uh, by uh, the boundary of the boundary of F2, we mean the set, and I'm going to denote it like the same way as boundary, so the set F2 of all uh, infinite, infinite uh, reduced words, words in A, plus minus one, B plus <laughs> one. Uh, so it's a subset. It's a closed subset. We'll take the space, this sort of shift space and uh, with four letters and consider all sequences that are reduced, meaning a, A inverse and B, B inverse don't appear next to each other. So there are no cancellations possible. So, i.e. words with no cancellation. Okay, now F2 acts on this. F2 naturally acts on this by uh, I guess like concatenation and cancellation, let's say. Concatenation and cancellation, uh, namely, so I'm just going to give an example, okay? So for like uh, if A is a generator, like okay, if S is a generator, <coughs> it would have been wise to call this S. This set S. So if S is a generator and W is a reduced infinite word, uh, then S times W equals uh, just S W if W doesn't start with S inverse, some W prime, and uh, and S time and uh, S times and otherwise uh, W is equal to so look W 
if if W starts with S inverse, so if W starts with S inverse, you don't want to put S in front in front of S inverse because then there would be a cancellation. So you basically in your mind just cancel these two and you get W prime. Okay, so you either just append the generator in front of the word, like this letter in front of the word, if it doesn't cause any cancellation issues, or you just, if it causes a cancellation issue, you remove the first letter, you cancel. Okay, so this is the action. I hope that that's uh, clear. So you, it's easy to see that this action is, uh, well, this action is actually continuous. So this, uh, this uh, is a continuous action. So it's a Borel action. I don't know how to write this word action. Um, and it is free, free except on a countable set. Uh, you can think about uh, when it is possibly non-free, like if you if it's periodic, right? It would be known free if you multiply by a word and then nothing changes all of a sudden. That means the infinite sequence was just the repetition of that word, nothing else. Okay, so uh, and so that's why it's countable. Okay, so but uh, we know that free actions uh, provide graphings that whose components are exactly the copies of their Cayley graph, right? This I call the Schreier graph. That means so uh, thus uh, this. Um, except for this free part, this uh, action admits um, a treeing. The orbit equivalence relation of this action admits a treeing, uh, a four regular treeing, a four regular treeing. Uh, so these copies. <coughs> Graph. Graph of F2. So let's draw it. Uh, or I will just um, copy paste from something here. This is the each connected component looks like this. So I just draw one connected component, there are continuum many. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, now, like the so, uh, so this looks very non-amenable uh, to those who have dealt with non-amenability because F two uh, is not amenable itself. However, it turns out that this the equivalence relation this action generates is hyperfinite. So um, and also these trees have continuum many ends, right? Perfectly many ends. So, you know, this, this equivalence relation better not be PMP because it would contradict Adams' theorem. So, uh, so in particular, in particular, there are uh, infinitely many ends. Uh, nevertheless, this, um, Action hyperfinite. In fact, it's a result of uh, Marchin, uh, Marchin and uh, Marquis that uh, for all hyperbolic groups, their, their boundary actions are hyperfinite. This is a baby version of that. Uh, so, why is it hyperfinite? Let's understand. So, hyperfiniteness, uh, so the reason it is hyperfinite is because. These trees actually secretly, so all like it looks like there are you know continuum many ends. These trees have continuum many ends, but secretly each tree has chosen a single end. It just doesn't look like that in the picture. And once you have chosen a single end, you can make it. You can prove that it is hyperfinite. So let me let me explain how this single end is true. Like, let me prove this. So uh, we show this. This um, by uh, showing that that uh, the these trees are actually 
the uh, graphs, the graph of uh, the string, sorry, this, by showing that, uh, okay, this, uh, by showing that the, the same orbit equivalence relation, the same, the orbit equivalence relation of this action, I'm going to find, denoted by this, like F2, uh, <coughs> also induced by a single one, not, not of it. So single uh, Borel countable to one function. Uh, function. Uh, well, and applying the result, uh, so and applying applying the result of Dougherty Dougherty Jackson Kerkris. Which says that says that like pairs are hyperfinite. What do you mean by induced by? Uh, induced by so one function also defines the orbit equivalence relation. Two points are in the same orbit of, of the same function. If um, uh, well, so okay. So two points are in the same orbit if there is an n and an m such that you can apply this function n and m times to these respective two points, and they they eventually will meet. So functions also you can. What is a graph of a function? So who asked the question? By the way, I didn't say. So what is a graph of a function? Right. Set of pairs for me is a set of edges of a graph on this space. And this graph, if it's countable to one function, is a locally countable graph, right? So this graph defines an equivalent. <coughs> Those are the orbits. Oh, but you symmetrize the graph. Yeah, you symmetrize the graph. So the connected components of this graph are the orbits of a function. And if equivalence relations defined by one function are known to be hyperfinite by this result. So all I have to do now is show that this, you know, F2 looking situation is a fake F2. There is another function that defines the same graphs. And so there is a directing of this, secret directing of these trees that makes it look like a graph of a function. So let's see what this function is. So, okay, so can you think about what function would be that would define the same orbit equivalence relation? So like, let's look at what happens in the case of cancellation. So you have, you know, when you apply a, gener a generator to a W, where this W starts with the inverse of that generator, what happens is a result, you just remove the first letter. But that, that function is the shift function. You just remove the first letter. Uh, so, okay, um, someone was asking yesterday to me if symbolic dynamics is going to show up. Yes, so here it is. Uh, so, okay, so um, let sigma be the shift map. The shift IE, you drop the first letter. So, yes, WN is mapped to WN plus one. The first letter doesn't exist. Uh, note that note that um, the, the induced the induced um, graphing so the graph of sigma not that uh, the graph of sigma sigma uh, as a graph is uh, just a directing a directing of uh, the, the, the tring above. And I'll explain, let me copy paste some pictures first. So, uh, so the graph of sigma, each component of the graph of sigma looks like this. Um, I'll need this picture also for something else. Okay, so each graph of sigma looks like this. Uh, let's see, where is X? Okay, so here is x, 
So let's let's consider the connected component of the graph of sigma that contains the point x. Then, sorry. Then, uh, what does sigma do? So if x is a if x is a particular uh, if x is a particular um, word, let's say x is this. Yeah. So x is I have to not screw up. So let me copy paste it. A B inverse A inverse. Okay. A B inverse, A inverse, dot, dot, dot. So let's say X is this word, this reduced word. Then uh, what does sigma do? So when you apply sigma, it just removes this A. So you get this sigma X, which is just basically the same as applying A inverse to X to delete this A. And the pre-images are precisely uh, whatever letters you can write here that doesn't cancel with A. Those are A, B, and A, B inverse. You can't write A inverse because that would cancel with A. So this is a three to one function. This uh, sigma function is a three to one function. Okay. And it, this tree is the same tree as this one, as this one. So now let's, let's draw the same, let's, let's you know, use this word to modify that other tree, to direct this other tree um, to show you. Okay. So let's say, Let's say this is x. So let's say this is my x. Then uh, where does the forward end for x go? So x, uh, when you apply sigma, you remove this a. So you have to go this direction. So this is the direction. And then when you apply sigma again, you have to remove this b inverse. So you go this direction. And then when, uh, so yeah, okay, when you apply uh, sigma again, you have to remove this A inverse, so you go this direction. And, and then I don't know, I didn't draw, so, but like maybe it's like something that spirals into of an end, like that. Um, okay, so, and all of them know this, like when you apply sigma to these other words, you get this, like if everyone is directed towards that one end. Oops, wrong. Okay, so everyone in this tree has a secret direction that goes, a coherent direction that they all go. And this is hyperfinitness, really. Like where when everyone agrees with one direction, uh, that, that, that graph is hyperfinite. So all, even though on the surface it looked like a million ended tree, it's actually, you know, secretly there is one, you know, somehow chosen end that we don't know of. Then, uh, so, okay, so in other words, their words. Uh, there is a secret chosen end. Selected is the word, I guess. Selected end in each uh, component of the tring, which makes it hyperfinite. Now, how did we see this chosen end? We somehow came up with a function, like we just did some magic. We came up with a function, or like we looked at you look at what the what you look at the point, and then you open the point. So for me, usually points in a space are black boxes. I don't open them. But here, when we open the point, turns out that it gave the information that go that way, right? <coughs> You know, this is not a measure theoretic or dynamical thing to do to open points. Uh, so uh, what we would like to understand which end was chosen by maybe looking at measures on the on the this space. So it turns out that it turns out turns out uh, that that um, this sec these secret ends. Ends are revealed or can be seen through revealed by uh, uh, quasi invariant measures. So, yeah, quasi invariant measures. Measures. Uh, I never defined what this is. So, I, I defined when E is measure class preserving for a fixed measure mu. But if you stand from mu's perspective and look at E, mu is quasi invariant with respect to E. Okay, so there are two players in the game. I defined it for, from the perspective of 
E, and you have to define it from the perspective of new. So uh, that's why Todor also mentioned quasi invariant measures. Okay, so these are so I uh, E uh, mu such that E is uh, E is uh, mu MCP measure of preserving. Okay, so now let's define one quasi invariant measure for this to just illustrate my point. So let's define uh, uh, a mu. A, a quasi invariant, a quasi invariant measure mu, measure mu on uh, its boundary using um, a simple random walk, non backtracking random walk, a simple uh, tracking random walk. Don't be scared of these words uh, if you're not a probabilist. <laughs> I'll, I'll define uh, in a descriptive, in a Bourbaki manner what this measure is. So what, what is this? So we want to define a measure. To define a measure, it's enough to define it on Klopen sets, on Klopen cylinders. So um, the measure on uh, a Klopen cylinder, cylinder, which I denote by, say, I don't know, a... Uh, a, B inverse, A inverse, A, oh, that, that I can't write. Uh, this is the set of all words, the set of all W in delta F, uh, starting with, starting with the word A, B inverse, A inverse B. Uh, so, okay, so this, we, I want to define the measure of this. So I define it uh, by just saying the following, uh, and I'll draw the random walk picture as well. So what is the chance that I chose A as my first letter? There were four letters to choose from. And so I give each letter probability one fourth. So the, the, the fact that I landed at one particular letter gives me probability one fourth. Now for each next letter, I have only three options here because I can't put A inverse. So the probability for each letter is one third. And so I multiply it by one third and the same keeps holding, keeps being true for the consecutive letters. So it's one third, one third, one third. That's the probability measure, okay? And this is non-backtracking random walk because you can think of it as, uh, maybe I have a picture here. Maybe it's not helpful, I don't know, but uh, you start with, a, this is your the free group on two generators, say, you start with from the identity and you have four places to go. So now you have, you know, four, you give probability one fourth to each situation, one fourth, one fourth. Now you're here, your random walk cannot go back to where it started. So that's why it's non-backtracking. Now it has three places to go. One third, one third, one third. Uh, maybe not. And so on. And then one third, one third, one third. You understand that this, yeah. So, so this non backtracking random walk defines the, uh, the measure. It's too long. Okay. Um, all right. So this is the measure. And uh, let's now look at how, what the situation looks with the chosen ends. So, so what is the red on Nicodem cycle, first of all, with this with this measure? Um, can can uh, someone make a guess uh, what would be the red on Nicodem cycle, say, uh, the, of x with respect to uh, this one? So, like, if measure if the weight of x is one kilogram, what is the weight of its shift with this measure? What what what's a guess? Three, that's right. Because, uh, because so each, basically for each point to be, I mean, it's a heuristic, okay? Uh, it's not a proof. The proof is you check the mass transport principle. So uh, the heuristic is that this is, first of all, you can say, show that the shift function is measure preserving under this uh, thing. So anyway, e each of these has to be equal weight uh, because we never distinguished. It was, a, it was an, you know, fair random walk. And then, um, um, yeah, I mean, each of these occurs with one third probability. Uh, basically, that's the heuristic. 
And so this is one third with respect to this. If this is one, this is one third. So let me, <coughs> let me draw these numbers. This is one third, this is one third, this is one third, this is one, this is three, this is nine, this is 27 and so on. Okay, so uh, let me record this, the red on nicotine. <coughs> Uh, the cycle is given by uh, so uh, I guess from the perspective of x sigma x is three uh, exercise uh, and this is a genuine exercise unlike the last one yesterday which was matters independent from ZFC uh, so exercise um two i think yeah, exercise two uh show this show that this is indeed the case uh, prove this okay so now let's go let's look again so this is the chosen end right this is the end that is uh, that is chosen in this tree uh and, and why so what is the difference between that end and the other ends look like we have many other ends here so we have uh uh, somehow, you know, it continues this way. Uh, it, it continues behind X. So it continues, yeah. So, uh, and somehow this is the only one that is chosen. From looking at the numbers, these red numbers that are given by the co cycle, what's a guess? So look, the back ones, this is one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, and then it comes one twenty seventh, one twenty seventh, one twenty seventh, as opposed to one three nine twenty seven powers of three, right? So the at least if you look at this geodesic to the, the chosen end, it grows to infinity. And the back back ones, in fact, decrease to zero. In fact, they are summable. Like these numbers are summable, okay? And that is the that sort of now we know that is why this end was so special because every other end decayed to zero, uh, at least looking at the geodesics. So it turns out this is a general phen phenomenon. It always happens this way. Uh, so now this brings me to the definition of uh, vanishing ends and non-vanishing ends. So vanishing ends and the generalization of Adam's dichotomy. Vanishing ends and uh, generalized uh, atoms. Okay, so uh, let T be a uh, tree of a uh, measure class preserving uh, C bear E. So like our usual setting um, with um, W, the red or nicotine co-cycle. Associated red on <coughs> co-cycle. Uh, did you say what's the non-generalized Adam's dichotomy? Yeah, that was the pre end, end of previous lecture to which this was a counterexample. The Adam's dichotomy is so that... The dichotomy is that either one or two. Yeah, yeah. So the, it's either it's amenable and has less than or equal to ends, or it is non-amenable and has perfectly many ends. That's how it's usually stated. But uh, I just stated the one if and only if, because the getting that it's not is perfect is easy. Uh, so, so yeah, so here is the if and only if, like a tree is a minimal if and only if at most ends. So no tree would have uh, three yeah. answers. No PMP. No PMP. No. Well, actually, if it has finite, well, if it has finite. Well, you still have, like, if it's not PMP, you could have as many answers. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. If it's, so sorry. Yeah, yes, yes. So uh, the, the smooth part would have, would be measure zero. Uh, because if it has three and say, you can take a bare center and it would be smooth. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, all right, so let's continue here. Uh, okay, so now we want to state the generalized uh, by me and Robin Adams that called to me. Okay, uh, and for that, I need the notion of uh, vanishing ends. So an end, uh, so let's, uh, for, a, for a T component, for a T component, C, um, an end inside this component, and at that, uh, that is in the boundary of this component, so is called, uh, oh, let me see how I wrote this. Let's see. Ah, I forgot to state something here. So, um, Sorry, be before we continue, I want to make a remark because some people asked me whether assuming equivalence relation is MCP is a restricted notion, a restrictive notion. So I want to make a remark that <coughs> remark, the assumption of MCT, so the assumption of MCP on uh, CBEAR is not restricted. Uh, is non-restrictive in the measure context uh, because of the following two reasons. Pick whichever one you like. A uh, is every, um, there is always an, a conal set, uh, or conal set X prime, such that E restricted to X prime is MCP is measure pass preserving. So there is some bad null set on which it fails to be, because of which it fails to be null preserving, you can remove it. Uh, if you don't want to remove anything from your uh, space, because this won't be an invariant set, then maybe you don't want to remove a non-invariant null set. So uh, here is another uh, option for you. There is a measure, there is a probability measure measure uh, measure new prime, which is uh, has less null sets than your original measure. So all your original null sets are null. No, the new, new null sets were null before, but it has fewer null sets. And uh, so uh, such that mu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu prime, and E is MCP with respect to mu. So which, which measure was first? The first one you started with mu and then... Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, see bear on x mu. Yeah, first one was mu. And basically, you can like move this mu around by the Feldman-Moore group elements and then... So, indeed, is mu prime. Yeah, sorry, with, with respect to mu prime. Yeah, so you know you will have even fewer null sets. So proving anything about this mu prime measure gives you a stronger theorem. Every, everything with the modulo mu null mu prime null sets it gives you a stronger theorem. So there is no harm in always assuming your uh, measured C bear is in fact measure plus preserved. Okay, so this is why this is not a particular situation. Okay, now I can state so definition. Um, an, uh, an end, so for a connected component, for a T component C, T, uh, oh, sorry, C, an end eta in uh, the boundary of uh, this component uh, is called vanishing. Uh, if so I'm going to write something and I'll ex explain it immediately. So if lim soup y converges to this end uh, of the radon nicotine co-cycle of y with respect to some arbitrary point in the same class C doesn't matter is zero. Where x is any some uh, point in point in C. 
so saying you know something red or nicotine converges to zero doesn't matter which base point you pick because converges to zero like if you pick two different base points the limit is going to just differ by a constant multiple and zero times constant is still zero so this x doesn't matter here it's a universal sort of definition now what is lim soup so uh maybe this the picture is still here but i'll redraw it on the ipad uh so uh what is lim soup so we, we we have this topology on the endification of the space so like you know on our space together with the ends so this is the, the okay so let's go down this is the picture this is the connected component of t this is c basically t restricted to c and this is the end, end eta so co to converge to this end that means you know any sequence of y's converging to a eta which can be uh, maybe I'll take a yellow and take any sequence converging to eta. So it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. You know, this is a sequence of y's converging to eta. Uh, uh, that sequence has the co-cycle on that sequence has to converge to zero. Uh, no, sorry, limbs. Yes, no, that is correct. So. Uh, so why don't you just say the limit? It's a positive function. Uh, wait, it's a positive function. Yes, it's just a limit. Sorry, thank you. OK, uh, it's because okay, it's because for non-vanishing, you need the limp suit. That's why. But uh, I'll write it in limp suit later. Thanks. OK, so, uh, so this means, let me write it in words. This means, means uh, for any epsilon, there exists a neighborhood, I'm going to write in parentheses because it's slight abuse of terminology, neighborhood uh, U of, uh, of this end of eta, by which I mean these are the U's. So these are the sides of finite sets. Remember, that's how we define topology on ends. These were the Klopin sets. So, uh, i.e., uh, sides of finite sets. And in a tree, you can take, instead of finite sets, you can take single points. So, finite sets. So, this, these are the u's. So, these are the u's. So, for every epsilon, there is one u such that uh, all the points inside that u have their cocycle is smaller than epsilon, such that uh, the cocycle of all points inside the U is smaller than epsilon for all Y in U. Okay, this is the definition. So it's just converging to zero in the topological sense. Okay, um, uh, so I guess I, I I will reiterate this. So I'll call this no, call this vanishing a uh, non-vanishing. So I'll call it a uh, non-vanishing. Or thus, eta is non-vanishing. Eta is uh, non-vanishing uh, if uh, you know the limb soup uh, as y converges to eta of uh, this thing is positive. So, i.e., uh, again, I will uh, want to emphasize, i.e., uh, there exists an epsilon such that. Uh, for all neighborhoods you pick, u uh, of eta, uh, there is a point inside the neighborhood, which I drew yellow, I guess, uh, in u such that uh, with, with the cocycle bigger than or equal to epsilon. So here you pick a neighborhood u, I will provide you with a point y. But no, this y may not be on the geodesic. It is even possible that on the geodesic it's summable. I'm just saying vanishing, non-vanishing means, you know, inside the neighborhood somewhere, there is a big point. OK, so that's the definition. Um, I want one more definition to spell the full power of our dichotomy. So the one more definition is that um, we call eta. We say that eta say that the end eta uh, has uh, w finite geodesics 
If if each uh, ray uh, to eta eta is w finite, uh, so I'll I'll describe uh, what what w finite means. So I e um, it's okay. Uh, we say that in parentheses we say that that a subset of the connected component is W finite uh, if um, uh, if you know if, if you think of this as weights if this which I define to be the sum of all y's in a oh, sorry this is a uh, if this set is summable, like if the weights are summable, it's finite. And hence you can understand what raw infinite means. Okay, so if the weights, so let's say uh, finite geodesics, W finite geodesic means if you look at this geodesic and look at the weights of points on this geodesic, these weights are summable, form a summable sequence, like in this case. So for instance, the all the back ends in this shift function, all the back ends are rho fine are, are w finite. They are some of their their weights are summable. Okay, now with these definitions, I'm ready to state the uh, the generalization of Adam's dichotomy. So yeah. So in our sum in your definitions, you didn't care that it was a tree, right? Like you stated it's only for trees, these definitions. Yeah, so vanishing and non-vanishing are uh, can be stated for any uh, for any graph that has ends. Uh, yeah, so with the same with the exactly same definition, and I must say also that uh, so even though Robin and I had this definition written down, we didn't fully conceptualize it until my work with uh, Ronnie and Greg. And so Greg Ronnie is the one who came up with the word vanishing. So somehow, as Greg says, uh, these two papers. Uh, have a common co-author, but uh, this term will come up independently. Uh, so, uh, okay. Anyway, so generalized Adam's dichotomy. So, so, so this uh, this notion, what happens when you change? I mean, the, the, this thing is invariant, I assume. Uh, it, well, <laughs> uh, it, what happens when you change mu? It, it's a this is a this is an invariant notion under under the measure class. Like it's it, it doesn't depend on, but it's a theorem. Like it's a you know you can't. It's not so easy. It's not so easy to prove, yeah. You basically prove that there is a core of non-vanishing ends. And it, this is like independent of measure. Like, yeah. By core, I mean, you know, like convex hall of non-vanishing ends, and this is indestructible. Yeah. So generalized um, Adam's dichotomy. Uh, so you can maybe guess what it is. Uh, so A. Um, on this is the wrong color. Um, okay, uh, I'll uh, give Robin also credit and myself. So Tucker draw. So one gets used to uh, m dashes and n dashes when working with Robin. Uh, okay, uh, it says a. So again, let so let E B E T um, uh, W mu be as above, <coughs> which means you know T is a string of E, T is a string of E, mu is the underlying measure, W is the cocycle, is the random nickname cocycle. Then the theorem is that E is amenable if and only if um, T has at most two non-vanishing ends, uh, let me, e almost every T component. Yes, at most two non-vanishing ends. Uh, if and only if, Almost every T component 
has at most two uh, ends um, that are that with uh, with infinite geodesics with uh, omega w infinite geodesics. So there are at most two ends for which this will uh, will be, will not be summable. Um, uh, this was this is the more important result. This summability is somehow only is only only makes sense for trees, whereas this is somehow a more universal statement, a more robust statement. But unfortunately, this is what took sweat, blood, and tears. This also took work, uh, a lot of work, but like this took more work, the statement. But anyway, yeah, this is... One of them, like the other one... No, they're orthogonal statements. The fact that geodesic is summable or non-summable has no consequence on what happens of the geodesic. And the fact that of, like the fact that things go to zero doesn't mean geodesics are summable. So it's that, that, that's why there are orthogonal statements. But in practice, are they the same? I mean, the... No, no, we have an example of a function uh, whose forward end is summable, but it's non-vanishing. Yeah, um, it's the Ramsey function, like the shift on uh, end. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm sorry for that question. Anyway, so like e, uh, the other one is e is nowhere mu nowhere amenable. So the nowhere amenable. Depend only if so, nowhere, mu nowhere blah. That means there does not exist a positive measure set on which your E is blah. Okay, so that like sort of says that I mean, you can only see amenability on null sets uh, outside of like you know, on big sets, you, you see non amenability immediately. So, okay, so E is mu nowhere amenable, depend only if almost every T component. Uh, has um, perfectly many ends, many non-vanishing ends. In fact, so I don't even know what this means. I mean, this means that you know the set forms. It's, so it's a perfect space of ends. The, the, this is a perfect space of ends, but. Uh, yeah, like I, you know, I'm not claiming this is closed in general, but this, in this particular case, it is closed. In fact, um, uh, the the set of non-vanishing ends, <coughs> non-vanishing ends, is uh, perfect, non-empty, perfect, non-empty, perfect. The usual definition of perfect, I guess, non-empty, uh, closed. Perfect. Uh, maybe I'll write it in red because this also took work. Uh, closed perfect subset. But, um, of, of the space of all ends of delta T C. Uh, the definition says it's F sigma. So this is the annoying part. Uh, so, but we show it's closed. Okay. Uh, and then this is again if and only if. Uh, if and only if almost every T component, I'm stating this because there is an open question coming, has perfectly many ends. So the set is perfect, meaning there is no isolated points. And uh, with, um, with infinite geodesics. So open question. <laughs> Uh, there is perfectly many ends with W infinite geodesics. Yeah. So, uh, question um, Is this set closed? So you just know that it contains the closed. No, but when I say perfectly many, I guess I'm not being a descriptive set theorist. I just, I just mean no isolated points, as no isolated points. Uh, so no isolated points, many, many ends with infinite geodesics. So 
for in the case of non-vanishing, we know it's a closed set. But in case of just the infinite geodesics, I still know that it's FC. Really countable? I mean, you're saying it has... Yeah, it could be countable. Oh, this is really bad. Uh, yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, okay, I mean, a Q is for perfect space, no? That's okay, but perfectly many means a different thing. Okay, fine. Let I don't know how else to say it. Like, okay, so here it's perfect. Okay, here it's perfectly many ends, and here is like uh, has a known empty has. Oh, I saw it. That's that's in itself. Every set is dense in itself. Well, it depends on the <laughs> I'm gonna say perfectly many, and then I specified here. That's what I mean. No isolated points. Okay, it's like English doesn't work otherwise. Uh, is this set? Okay, I don't know whether this set is closed um, as of today. So uh, okay, so this is the dichotomy, and in the remaining time, so uh, I uh, yeah. So yeah. these two imply that. If you have E, then for every, almost every component could have either less or equal than two non vanishing ends or else uh, perfectly many. That's right, yes. That you have this dichotomy and that splits into a, the amenable part and nowhere amenable part. So basically, you can read off amenability by looking at your tree, but with this high, highs and lows of <coughs> red and cycle. Okay, so. Um, the, um, uh, okay, so how do you prove this? To understand how you prove this, you first maybe want to see how you prove the original Adams dichotomy. Where is it? Or oh, it's in the previous lecture. So maybe we want to understand how to prove this first to understand how to prove this generalization. So um, so the PMP Adams dichotomy. has basically two proofs. can be proven using cost. Uh, so cost is what is, I mean, uh, cost is this, uh, you know, infimum of every uh, expected degree of, uh, expected degree of graphing. So expected degree of graphing. You show that if the thing is amenable, then the expected degree must be two. And then, because it's PMP, uh, because it's PMP, um, this expected degree corresponds to actually the right, the correct degree. You have to see that degree somewhere, and so you have to see this degree two. And then you can you start seeing these lines in your classes, and lines means amenable. Uh, if, if your equivalence relation is lineable, then it is hyperfinite. We sort of discussed this at some point. But so, but this theory, the theory of cost breaks in the outside of PMP. <coughs> uh, cost breaks uh, outside of PMP. Uh, the main reason is that. Uh, outside of PMP, you have this weight weighted situation with this red or nicotine weights, and what breaks is so these weights are one in PMP. So if something weighs seven kilo, you know it has seven elements. In 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 quasi PMP, you have no uh, correspondence between kilos and number of elements. That's the basic reason why things don't work. Okay, so this breaks outside of PMP. However, there is the Adams's original proof. Uh, however, Adams's original proof proof use didn't use cost. Uh, used what's called end selection. End selection uh, instead. Uh, which we'll discuss. Uh, we'll uh, discuss next. Uh, in order to discuss it, uh, I want to finally define something that I can't believe is almost the end of the second lecture and I haven't defined, namely smoothness for an equivalence relation. So uh, to, to state it 
uh, we need to well, define uh, smoothness. Smoothness, which is a triviality notion for C pairs. Okay, so uh, smoothness. Maybe I'll uh, I'll copy paste this, <coughs> go over it. I hope you will uh, forgive me because uh, to save time, I already wrote it nicely. It seems okay. Um, you. Okay. Oh, some things didn't copy. Uh, all right. So uh, I'll write that line again. Okay, so uh, what is smoothness? So a C bear E uh, in which, which in my head is like, this is, this is uh, the Borel space X and the C bear is like, these are these small thin, thin things uh, are the E classes, okay? So a C bear E on X is called smooth uh, for the lack of a better word really, especially for smooth dynamics, people don't even think about anything differentiable here. Uh, so uh, there exists, if and only if there exists, um, this is not the definition, but this is an equivalent condition, which is all I need. So forgive me. So the, if there exists a Borel selector, so you can pick a point in each E class in a Borel fashion. So there is a Borel function, function that literally takes X to a point in its class and in such a way that two points are equivalent if and only if the chosen points are the same and this chosen point is in the same class, okay? It's equivalent for countable directions. Uh, sorry? This, 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 this is this. equivalent for only count C bears, yes. For no, other relations, no. Yeah, so uh, I, in Montreal, uh, Damien Gaborio started his lectures by saying, you shall never, first commandment, you shall never pick a point. So the C bears, so the smooth C bears are exactly those that uh, disobey the first commandment. They pick points. And these, these are trivial because once you have picked a point, you can, for instance, you know, prove that it is hyperfinite by drawing a line <coughs> from it. You can draw an elephant if you want, if once you pick a point. So you can draw anything. So that's why, uh, for example, exercise number four is smooth implies hyperfinite. So show that. By picking a point, you construct your hyperfinite, witness to hyperfiniteness, okay? That uses this Feldman-Moore result that I stated in the, in the very beginning of the first lecture. Uh, another exercise I want to assign is, so mu smooth means like it's a smooth on a conal set, okay, like I wrote here. Another exercise is that uh, measure class preserving E is smooth, if and only if uh, almost every E class is W finite, meaning co-cycle finite, so it's summable. In the PMP, that just means that almost every class is finite. In, in this uh, MCP, setting, it just means that almost every class is weight, the weight, total weight is finite, okay? All right, so, uh, uh, so then uh, uh, I want to mention one more thing before we, I guess I can't do any selection today, but one, if we're discussing smoothness, I want to mention a result of Ben, which is relevant here, Ben Miller, so uh, uh, a result, so uh, Ben Miller, Miller showed that endless streams are smooth. Are Borel like Borel smooth? Oh wait, smooth without even dropping an alpha. So if you have a tree, each component has no ends, then the, this equivalence relation is smooth. Okay, uh, we generalize this uh, uh, general. Uh, this uh, or everything is locally countable. Sorry, like trims that are locally countable. Everything. Basically, you do the shaving, and then uh, you end up with uh, stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so okay. So, so okay. A theorem of me and Robin is again. Uh, uh, so is that we characterize smoothness. So, okay, so like characterization of smoothness. Uh, 
uh, I like this characterization, so uh, sorry. Uh, it says that uh, a trimming is smooth, uh, a, a trimming is an MCP trimming, so measure plus preserving trimming um, is, uh, well, measure smooth, so uh, up to null sets smooth, if and only if, uh, I guess almost uh, it has, so um, there are no, all ends are vanishing, sorry, all ends are uh, up to null sets, so after discarding a null set. So really like uh, this also somehow generalizes bent stuff that the endless trees are smooth. It says, well, I mean, trees can have ends and still be smooth, but then the ends have to be vanishing. Okay, so uh, so I'll I'll end here, and next time I'll start with uh, the end selection to explain how to prove Adam's dichotomy. So I finally prove something next time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there are. Uh, yeah, so I'm not saying that I'm an <coughs> expert on this topic, but Wikipedia says that subsets are called bands in cell with dashes between the words. Sorry, I, I didn't hear that. <laughs> I just wanted to say that Wikipedia says that subsets are called bands in itself or yeah. themselves with dashes between the words. And this is a different thing than the fact that, that yeah, without dashes. <laughs> But that is for uh, the, that is for orders, no? In particular, it says that uh, a set is perfect if it's dense in itself and closed. I see, I see. <laughs> Checkmate. Fine. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll then you're saying that I should say has dense in itself many with, ends with dashes. With dashes. Okay. All right. Well, maybe I'll I'll, I'll do that when I send it to you. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, so in the in the one end case, so you get this function again, which points. Uh, yeah, the and end. yeah, that's the main so game. Can you get it to be measured? With it? Can you change the measure so that this function is measured with the thing? I mean, the same way that it was on the on the tree. No, I don't think so. Like there is too much mass sometimes. Like you know, you you would have to. Even though there is some and everything. I mean, the, 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 the function is measure preserving or the equivalence relation is measure preserving? No, function. function. Um, I haven't have thought about it, but even in that case, it won't necessarily help. You won't get, you may still, I mean, it may be decaying, right? Like, you know, each then each point, uh, the pre-image sums up to one, right? Like if this is the point, but that doesn't prevent having, like, you know, you still might not, it might not be actually distributed here. And it, it, you may, you know, convert you. You will have a decreasing sequence, but that decreases to one half, let's say. So that won't prove. E even if that was possible, that won't prove the dichotomy. Measure so preserving has to split into the same. I mean, the same measure every time. So to go to zero. Yeah. No, no, no. The, you can you can have like one. Like for example, the shift with like two, two to the n, two to the n with the Bernoulli one third, right? Then the co-cycle is one third, two thirds, one third, two thirds. So it's not, it's not split. Well, it's not equal. It's not one third, one third, one third, like in this. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah that's all I'm saying. Okay. Any more questions or comments? <coughs> Let's thank Anush again. Final cups.